Welcome back. <laughs> You've made it to season three, episode one of Podcast Bozo, where you came just in time to join us in the conversation about quantum physics, free will, and a little bit more than that. Here with me, as always, we have locally renowned beer server, Sean, and the celebrated artist slash animator, Eli. My name is JJ, but you can call me Bobby Paradise. As always, it's good to be with y'all. I want to mention first that this is a podcast and it's supposed to be a group effort. We want to hear from you, so please visit podcastbozo.com or our social accounts using at podcastbozo and chime in on our conversations. We will do our best to collaborate with you and chat with you. Cheek, what's that? How do they find us again? What you're going to want to do is you're going to pull out that phone. You're going to head to Instagram or Twitter and you're going to type in the search bar at podcast bozo. That's P O D O C A S T B O Z O P O D O. Wait, how, how do you spell again? Uh Oh, all right, hit it, cheek. <laughs> P-O-D-C-A-S-T-B-O-Z-O. Thank you so much for tuning in. Back to you, JJ. And that's about as smooth a start as you could expect from Podcast Bozo Season Cheek. 3, Episode 1, Episode 22 overall, 23 overall. Was that your librarian voice? How do you describe that? I call that my... Talking to the fishes underwater voice, JJ. Thank you for asking. <laughs> well, now that we have you trapped here, please take a chance and uh, donate to our Bozo Fund, and we will give you a shout out, read you whatever you leave in the donation message, uh, read whatever you leave in the donation message, or even write you a little ghost story if that's what you want, or a little ghost written story if that's what you want. It's up to you. Uh, all you got to do is donate. And Please give us a chance. The whole episode won't be that rough, um, but it will be at the same time. But you'll you'll enjoy it. I, I guarantee it. But Cheek, how how is your uh, holiday season? Your December since we last talked. Ho ho ho, JJ, <laughs> and a happy new year. It was a it was a good it was a good holiday season. Mm. Cheers. Descriptive. I'll, I'll, I'll cheers to that. <laughs> A unique summation of your time away, Chief. <laughs> Good holiday season. All right, e, you you I, you told me earlier a little bit about yours, but hit me hit me with some more deeds. Uh, there were Swedish meatballs involved. There was eggnog. There were some old time movie classics. You know, Home Alone two in New York. Uh, that's that's your classic Christmas right there. Mm-hmm. You said some. Holidays. Were there other Holiday. ones in there? Somewhat movies. Wait, you said some you watched Holiday Home Alone too. Yeah. Were you were you watching you know, that New York? because you're a big fan of our president Donald Trump and you just wanted to uh, watch his movies? He's in there. Now he watches that movie because he loves that pigeon lady. I, this <laughs> is very true. This is very true. The the whole living at the does she live in an opera? She the lives in like the house. attic of an opera house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we only made it halfway opera. through, but this, oh, <laughs> there's so many things about this movie that are just life, dream goals, including pigeons and living in an opera house. I won't get into it, but definitely that movie is a, a cornerstone of the foundation of who I am today due to pigeons. That's a bold statement to just base your life off of right there. Okay. Influence is influence. Cheek, what got, are you looking for? I out got there? peepers. They're peeping on me. Are you the pe- you you're the one Christmas peeping? Carolers? There, Cheek? They're peeping into my abode. Really? Who are they? I think it's the elves. All right, all the right. elves. <laughs> Probably saw you looking all sexy in that button down. Want to get more of a peek from you? I dressed yeah. up for you. <laughs> well. We had a good season last season, boys, and I think it was an improvement from the season before that. We had more guests, and I think we had a diverse group of guests. I don't want to say anyone was better than another, but 
it was fun to talk in each to talk to each and every one of them. Um, we got some good guests coming up this next season. Uh, we got a really diverse group of guests again. Um, we still have a couple slots open for confer- confirmations, but we have three that have confirmed. Um, I don't want to talk about it too much more than that. It will be coming up in the future, but I'm excited for it. Um, I hope you guys are excited for it too. It's, I, I don't know. This, this feels like, this feels like the, uh, the last stretch of the Kentucky Derby, but it's just going to protect, uh, perpetuate forever. You know, like we're, we're finally reaching our stride. We got full gallop. The announcers are all screaming. Um, they're all stoked about what's going on here. It, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like when the kick returns happening, we're past the 50 at this point. I'm uh, Isaiah McKenzie. But- I hit the 50 going to the 40, the 30, the 10. Touchdown! And and Cole Beasley, by the way, just released uh, uh, his new rap song last night. So that's something you should go check out. Um, I, I saw that. Is that you think that's what he's doing with his downtime now? When he's not, when he can't practice. Well, I was wondering what, how he did that with his time. He he has albums from like 2017 that I've listened to, and they're uh, judge them at judge them at your own will. Um, but they're fun to listen to uh, because I love Cole Beasley and I know he's a great guy and he's just he's practicing art that he enjoys. So uh, can't condemn him too much for that. Um, but well, yeah, so I I, uh, I gotta ask you: Are you JJ? Are you a little jealous of Cole Beasley's Beasley's flow? Am I a little jealous? No. Am I extremely jealous? Yes. Oh, you have similar flow, though. There's nothing to be jealous about I'm, there. I'm, He's ex- blonde. I'm extremely jealous. And I am planning on cutting my hair into a mo- mohawk and dyeing it all blonde. And that's not going to be too different. Cole Beasley has a different look on. He has like the Viking long on top, short on the sides and around the back. That's pretty cool. Um, but I've had my eyes set on a mullet, mullet for a long mullet. time. And I've just never been able to commit. And uh, I think it's my time. I think it's my time pretty you know, soon here. As as my hair has been growing out like this, I've been feeling uh, the ghost of the mullet tingle my neck again. Because I used to have one, and now it's kind of tickling my neck a bit, and I'm reminding me of what it's like. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just getting in the mindset again. But I don't know if I'm going to go mullet. I think I'm just going to keep it bowl cut. E, that reminds me. You got a, you got a haircut over break? Not only do no, you get- No, I didn't get a haircut. I just kept growing it out. You can't fool me with those bangs. You cut those bangs. They're I, cut I, straight across. I might have done some uh, <laughs> baby scissors cutting on the front for the bangs, but no, this is this is my hair, baby. This is me. I think I think what blows me away is that people say that during the winter, your hair and nails grow a little longer. They grow faster, I should say. Um, but we are barely into winter, and e your hair grew like someone just dipped your head into a pile of miracle grow and well, i <laughs> jay i'll tell you what it is rogaine rogaine no. the, the great conjunction you, you know when the saturn and jupiter cross pass on mm-hmm. your birthday yeah the uh, 21st what happened was i just woke up the next day with such a bad headache and i stayed in bed the whole day and then i swear to god you know truth I woke up the next day and it was just long. I, I grew an inch overnight. I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I wished upon a shooting star that night, but I think it was a great conjunction. <laughs> it's it's like a it's like a permanent boner for your hair, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You're a grower, not a shower. Hey. I you make me blush. All I gotta say is I got a beautiful head of hair. Thank you, Winter. Thank you, Solstice. Mwah. Do you think, do you think that father Christmas blessed you with the full head of hair? Father Christmas? Uh, could be, could be, you know, there's a lot of factors going on at the end of the year. You got conjunctions, bajunctions, but the uh, it's a long list. Grandfather, uh, <laughs> grandfather time and the father of Christmas are both two viable solutions for this head of hair. Do you think we're too deep to scratch this recording? (laughs) (laughs) Do you you identify with the ghost of Christmas past, present, or future the most, do you think? Uh, Remind me which one's which. Where are we going off of? You just got to guess which one. Uh, I like the... uh, Future. Why? 
You seem like you just said that one at random, but I want to hear you support that answer. Yeah, I, I don't. I did. I did. I did. Yeah. I got. I got backtrack. Not the future. When I think the future, I think of uh, Scrooge's uh, Grim Reaper guy and, and the spooky. Well, that That's that past, was the Ghost it? of Christmas Future. Oh, was future. it? I was uh, thinking. Yeah, uh, it was, Ghost it was of the Christmas Angel past. of Death. Is isn't, pass is isn't pass the shackle man? Pass is shackle man, or isn't he a big giant? No, pass. Yeah, past is the the he's a he's a happy ghost. He's a jolly ghost. Yeah, yeah. The, go the shackle man is the ghost of his old business partner. Partner. Mm. Isn't that from It's All Sunny, or is that actually from the legit Christmas story? A Christmas Carol. Yeah, by Charles Dickens. It's a fairly famous uh, novel. But he's not asking Cheek. He's Christmas tale. It's about Christmas. <laughs> Cheek, don't let his hair fool you. He's not a dumb, beautiful jock. All right, he knows. He knows the story. It's just that he's confused as to where that specific character comes from. He he thought it was a. Uh, which character? Well, I, I'm, done, I'm done defending you. E. I can't I'm do done, it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're moving on from. <laughs> we got to move on. We got to move on. Um, so. <laughs> Despite that, all right. Just to be just to be balanced in our in our holiday season, to be true to the holiday spirit, not just the Christmas spirit. E, what's your favorite day of Hanukkah? Seventh. Why? Uh, because when they lit the candles and they kept going and going and going it and wasn't burning a candle. through. All right, it's it was, time to move on. It was an oil um, lamp. I think. I think, all right. all right, that's enough. Um, I, Cheek, you just shattered my childhood dreams. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen here, E. And you listen good. The holidays are a time of giving and of love. Now, I know you were on Santa's bad list last year. Don't let it happen again. Please, if anyone's been naughty it's been jj i mean look at that smirking face well that's true that's true all right let's move on that's enough of that um <laughs> i can't i uh that has been a roller coaster of a start i think we just did that for about 20 minutes whatever just happened and uh you better believe it we scripted every bit of that um <laughs> we wrote it all down hey, on paper <laughs> Fini. uh fiend <laughs> you're welcome um but yeah, welcome back. Um, one one last bit of housekeeping is that we uh, that the T-shirt contestant winners are going to come out this week. We might maybe we should record uh, the picking of those those folks. Um, and so it's going to be a little process because we got to then order them and make them and things like that, get the sizes right. But um, if you've participated or are still thinking about participating, you've got a day or two after uh, this episode releases. Uh, to get your kicks in uh, before Route 66 gets paved on over and uh, it's time for the big old highway. But are you guys ready to hop into this topic? Yeah, we got to strap in. I know it's going to be a bumpy ride. If you guys have drinks, I'd advise, uh, yeah, first buckle up. Buckle up. Um, But after that, I want you guys to take a sip of your drink. I want anyone who's listening, if you're at work... Get to that water, pause this for a second, get to that water cooler, strap in. Wipe your mind from that first 10 minutes that was so sad. Yeah, just, yeah, full blast bidet your brain, um, you clean that all off. And uh, yeah, so I, I think this topic comes with a promise of of big things. I listened to, uh, I think it was three or four out of eight. MIT lectures of a quantum physics class. Um, so equiv equivalented, that's not a word, to three and a half hours of quantum physics training. Um, so I basically have a degree from uh, MIT now. Honorary degree. I'll wait for them to reach out to me. Um, but I, I guess I guess the, the gist of the topic is we're going to be looking at quantum physics uh, and then dial into quantum entanglement. And in... We'll have some sidetracks of simulation theory, um, simulation theory, uh, we'll talk about determinism, free will, um, it, it'll, it'll get all over the place and I encourage it. Let's take a sip of these first. Also, thank you for the larceny whiskey, um, awesome B. 
uh, you've been a big donator. Andrew D, you've been a big donator as well. Um, and at halftime, we got a couple of special surprises for you guys, so keep listening. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about quantum physics. You guys have any familiarity with quantum physics? Um, you, like, give me, <clears throat> give me a guess, E. E, give me a guess. Well, when I first got into college, they made you sign up for an introductory course, FSEM, they called it. Yep. I don't know what that stands Freshman for. Freshman seminar. Freshman seminar. And I got put into quantum mechanics. Uh, that was That's a weird badass. fitting group. There were like some soccer kids in there who didn't know how they ended up in there. I actually want to be in there, but. Oh, wild ride. That was the last time I ever uh, looked into or read or learned about entanglement theory and all the sorts. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to see what the MIT nerds have learned since then. And was that six years ago? Something like that. Do you have any basic understanding? No, I um, elected to not take physics in high school and instead took an environmental course. Uh, so I know little about physics and um, uh, quantum, um, uh, not much. And Tanglement, I do love the Disney movie Tangled, though I think we're going in a different direction with this topic. So. Uh, with that, I don't know much. I'm excited to learn. Um, maybe, may, you know, maybe Ant-Man, a little guest appearance from Ant-Man might explain to us the quantum realm a little bit. Maybe, probably not, but he might, you never know. He might join in. I will say not specifically the Ant-Man movie, but like obviously the findings in that movie led to the Avengers movie. Um, and I will tie some of that stuff back because I think some of that is actually kind of pretty tangible and it's been played out on the screen. Um, it can make this a little better. And if you get lost at any point, we are going to post some visuals online. We will screen share some stuff. Um, so just write it out with us. Look at the YouTube video. Mm hmm. Yeah, if you're not Paul watching Rudd this, show if, you're not, if you're not engaging with us on YouTube and listening and watching on YouTube, I frankly don't know what you're doing at this point. Um, you disgust me. <laughs> well, you don't disgust me. Uh, I'm happy you're listening. <laughs> well, you look like an absolute idiot yeah. to everyone in the community, and we're all looking at you. You look like Eli with his short hair. Um, <laughs> but all right. So one more preface question um, before I do more prefacing. But do you guys? believe in free will or determinism? Uh, let's start with Cheek on this one. Define determinism for me. Is that just destiny? D yes, that would be like from the minute the universe was created and more relevantly to you, the atoms and people and the things that play where you were born, who is your parents, that stuff slowly determined who you are. Like you barely had any choice along that way. Free will would the be the answer is free every, will. You can choose who you are and what your life is. E? I think determinism. Why? Um I guess because I learned early on that you know, if you see the moon is something like something miles away, but the light from the moon travels eight minutes to get to the earth. So whatever we see from the moon is eight minutes ago. And I'm not sure if this is an argument for it, but if someone on the moon saw us, they would see us from eight minutes ago. And if you expand that to years from now, so stars that see us from like the dinosaurs and stuff, they're seeing that, but anything past that has already happened. So as if to say... I guess this was the argument for determinism when I first learned it, but everything is already on the timeline and is either is at A or B, whatever point, and visually you can be seen any point in that timeline. We're already getting like head trippy. It's yeah, hard, it's hard to follow through this because well, it's abstract. But. I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out what you mean exactly because you're saying that supports determinism, but what you're saying is just like you're receiving a message. Like, so if you, if you boil down to what you, what you were just saying, it sounds like you're saying like, if I sent you a letter based on what's been going on in my life, 
Right. It would take three days to get to you. You would read that letter and that would be your most up to date version on what's going on in my life, even though more has happened since then. And that sounds less like determinism and just delayed. Well, I think there's I think there's a second part to it, which I can't describe right now. But I think there's a second part that convinced me where um, if you bend space and time, like if you if you go into a wormhole or something. Time will continue down that specific path. And there's if there's a way you can see that end that point further down the timeline. Can we can, that can can we get you? Uh, I hate to interrupt. It sounds like you're getting really into that. And I feel yeah, like let's not dive too into it. Just like in a in a very simple like belief question. Do you believe in destiny or do you believe in free will? I feel like let's start there, right? I believe yeah, in free I wanted will. To, I wanted to get into what he was saying specifically because I think some newer findings discount those. But then at the end, he started getting into something that might be kind of related to quantum physics, uh, where you're saying like there's these shoot offs of where like you start and end kind of thing and like destiny split a little bit. Um, but fair enough, Cheek. I, um, I'm willing to I feel like you're just getting ahead of me. I feel like you went A to C and I'm somewhere between A and B and I have no idea where we're going. Yeah. Fair enough. So we got to tread lightly with this topic. We're not going to tread lightly. We will start by wading in. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to start by wading in. But at some point we're going to dive straight into a tsunami. But, um, the, the first thing that we want to look at here is, um, First thing I want to put a disclaimer is that Eastern, uh, one thing that was made clear to me through a lot of my research is that there's a lot of Eastern beliefs like in Asia and things like that, where they accept that the things they see are a perception and that um, nothing is concrete. A lot of their beliefs kind of align with that. And I can't speak to that more than that because I'm, I'm not, I don't know a lot about those beliefs, but it's just something I find in a lot of the philo- philosophical findings that I was looking through is that uh, there were a lot of like Buddhist sp- specifically beliefs that were like talking about how these are, that would be related to quantum physics. There were like literally YouTube videos saying like Buddhism and quantum physics, quantum entanglement. Um, so that culture is more conditioned to accept these findings than we are because we are such like a logical factual our western society is just kind of like laid out for us it's it's very logical and some of this stuff gets not logical um and it 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 goes against our logical beliefs as we see like um and it starts small and it get and there's bigger implications so what i want to start with i guess is that um Obviously, th- these experiments started with protons, electrons, neutrons. Um, and in, in, in the past, physics had everything to do with it. Was, everything was like very tangible and logical and consequential. Like you think about the flipping of a coin, right? That may seem random and statistical, but a physicist back in the day. And even now, in this specific case, but a physicist can, in physics, can watch you flip that coin, and if they had all the data, but just didn't see the end result, what it landed on, heads or tails, they could tell you exactly what that landed on, right? Because they could calculate air, air friction, velocity, force, gravity, all that stuff. That was the Newtonian physics of everything, right? Um... And so everything was calculated and everything had a specific start and you could figure it all out. That's high school physics. That's most of college physics. Um, But in the recent past, and not even that recent, but recent past comparatively to Newton, people have... Newton. Newton. uh, I did yell that. But people have started realizing that Physics aren't that finite. They aren't that tangible. They aren't that calculable. There are hidden variables, um, which is a key term that we will be touching on a little bit later, that um, 
that contribute to this factor. So let's get into something a little more. Let's start diving into the topic. Hold on, real been... quick. My doinker ran out of ink. Will you grab me a new one? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if this doinker has some ink. Um, so let's start. Let's start off with something. How's that? Also, yeah, real good. quick, my um slurper ran out of sauce. I'm gonna go to the fridge and be right back. You can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Keep talking. All right. So let's start with a fundamental. Let's start with a fundamental truth is that electrons are identical. They're indistinguishable, which is more so than identical. Um, what I mean by that is you can have identical twins. They might be able to stand next to each other. Their DNA may be very similar. You may It may be hard to stand them apart, but they are different people. There are differences between them. If you take two electrons, they're, they are the same. Indistinguishably, they are the same. Um, there's no way to tell them apart. They aren't different. Um, if you have... If you have A particle and B particle, one might be green, might, one might be red, there will be 10 ways to distinguish them, to put them into two beakers. You could put them both together in one, put them both together in another, switch them, switch them. All those would be distinguishable. But with two electrons or two protons, if you take them and put them in different beakers, switching them around would not be a different scenario because those two Electrons are the same exact thing. They're indistinguishable. That is not a different scenario if you switch A from B. There is no A. There is no B. They're the same exact thing as far as we know today. That's with electrons and both protons. Protons and neutrons. Yeah, it's subatomic particles. And, and neutrons, you said? Yeah. Those are the three aspects of making up an atom. Um, Isn't there the a fourth that's important, particle to an atom? Well, there are a subdivide. Particle? You get quarks inside of them. Yeah, there's there's sub part subatomic particles. All right, so I guess that's a sub. So atomic particles are protons, neutrons, electrons. Skip over that. <coughs> so what we're talking about here is electrons. And at an electron level, someone ran an experiment at one point um, called the double slit experiment, um, and basically. What that is, is if you took a paintball gun and you shot it at a wall, it's just straight. It's facing straight at the wall. It's fixed. No one's spraying and praying or anything like that. Um, if you shot it, there's going to be some spin on those paintballs. You know, they're going to not always hit the same spot, um, but they're going to hit kind of like a pattern and it's going to be reliable. Like after you shoot enough, there'll be a reliable shape that you will always see. Statistically, they'll, you'll always see that shape. Um, let's not account for like diminishing of CO2 in the back of the gun or anything like that. Let's just say it's a constant speed, a uh, constant shape, constant um, distance that it has to go. If you, the double slit experiment basically says that in this case, if you put, a wall in bet halfway between where the paintballs were launched and where the paintballs hit the observable pattern that they made. If you put a wall in there and put two slits that are passable, if you're shooting that paintball gun, now all of a sudden, through those slits, some of the paintballs would go, and on the back end, you will see uh, a pattern that was made by the ones that made it past the double slits, right? Does this make sense to you guys? Where there'll be two vertical lines if you shoot enough paintballs of where the paintballs landed on the back wall. And we're going to call this the point of observation. Um, and that's what you expect, right? You expect that you open up that those two slits because it's like, Sheik, you look like you're a little troubled on this. If you have two walls, one solid and there's another solid one behind it, you would shoot a paintball gun on the first solid wall. You'd see this painting of paintballs. You open up two vertical slits all of a sudden, that painting of paintballs gets let, two slits of it get let through and land on the back wall, right? And what you would expect from that is that you'd have this vertical painting of paintballs. If you take that down to, and that's what you'd expect. Uh, you don't have to be watching that. You don't have to have anything else. It just happens. If you take that down to a subatomic or an atomic level, um, which has, this is a true experiment. This has happened thousands of times, been recorded with thousands of different types of equipment, materials, all that stuff. Um, 
take down take this down to shooting electrons instead of paintballs. Same exact experience. Um, you shoot paintballs at a you shoot electrons at a wall through a double slit, and um, what ends up happening is you get a wave pattern. And what a wave pattern is is this. It looks kind of like, if you're mathematically painting it on an X and Y axis, a wave pattern it looks like a heartbeat almost. It can look like anything, but best explanation is a heartbeat. And that basically is is a statistical prediction of a landing point of an atom. Um, I know we're still far away from this, and just stay with me. Um, stay with me on this. But if you shoot atoms at a double slit... As opposed to paintballs, which give you those two slits, right? Those two defined slits as if you just like sprayed paint through two little windows and it landed on the other side. Um, with atoms, you get this wave pattern, which basically, um, and I might share this at this point because I think you guys are struggling to see what I'm talking about. Um, which basically leaves this like probability pattern on the wall. Um, so let me just share this screen. That's the cat. Chi, can you see that? Chi? Uh, yeah, I can see that. All right. Um, so what we're looking at here, let's look at this one first. This is a complex example, and it took me a while to understand what we're looking at. Um, if you look at this beam gun, electron beam gun, it's shooting them out, um, and it's going through these two slits, you don't know which one it's going through, and it's landing on this back wall, and what they end up seeing is these vertical lines, uh, the darkest one being the most populated by electron hits, the outside ones being the next and the next, you know, so this is, this ends up being what, it, it's congruent with what scientists or physicists consider as a probability wave. and. What they're saying, and, and this is all about the point of observation, and in this case, our point of observation is that screen at the end, right? Because we don't know what happened. You can't see an electron move that fast, right? You can only see when you open up the experiment, pull out that little film, and see that these electrons hit in this weird interference pattern. So the, the first shocking part about this is that it doesn't agree with that if you do it with a paintball gun, right? You do it with a paintball gun, there's two slits that this can line up with after shooting a thousand paintballs. In this case... There's this interference pattern, which what's called a it's it's a two waves interfering with each other. So, your breath. Take is this a deep like breath. uh? Is this like when you're developing film where some areas get more light than others? They become more developed. Like in this photo, you're showing there's the first two bars. Oh wait, there's there's five bars. Um, but some areas get more developed than others. Um, like there's there's a faded area from the bars where the waves hit on their their apex or their max am amplitude. You know what I mean? Yes, it it could be something to do with that. Let me keep going here. Okay, yeah. The, the first the first third of this is going to be me talking a lot, um, so that people can kind of grasp what's going on here. If you drop a pebble in water you'll see waves, right? One pebble in water, you'll see waves. If you drop two pebbles simultaneously next to each other, you'll see their waves, and then you'll see where their waves intersect, and then you'll see where those waves kind of perpetuate forward. What we're seeing here with this interference pattern without observation until the experiment's done and we pull this out is what you would see if you drop two pebbles into water and they interfered and then hit a wall. So... Basically, what's happening is that we're seeing a probability of where the atom made up would land. If we shot 10 of these electrons at the wall, we would see a couple speckles. There wouldn't be that much of a pattern. If we shot 3,000 of these at the wall, um, you would end up seeing this interference pattern because it's, that's just statistics. You know, like you, it's a randomness um, that kind of sorts itself out over time. So, and I can see you guys are still struggling and I... I'm, I was kind of, I didn't expect that to, this doesn't, this shouldn't resonate with anything because it's not practical at the moment, right? You're saying, what is practical? 
how does this apply to our daily lives? Why does this matter? Well, what's revolutionary about this is that, like I said, those paintball guns, they spray through the two slits, you get two side things. That's what they expected when they shot these electrons. Instead, they got this wave pattern, which basically says that at the point of observation, there is a statistical likeliness of the atom ending up anywhere on those three wave patterns. And by observing at that point, you are seeing that the atoms ended up there, or the electrons ended up there, to be more specific. On that wall, in those lines, the center being the most likely, the next two on the outside being the least, uh, the next, and then the next on the outside being the next least likely. And that's an interference pattern. What this is proving, basically, is that, and this is giving me something I'll take a second to understand, is that as, that basically, our understanding of what is real is based on observation because because as they go through those two slits what expected didn't happen instead a probability appeared so if we take this out to a grander sense let's look at schroeder's cat experiment now if you take a we're only, radioactive we're only observing the dark pattern in everyday life and what's happening right now, we, ob we observe one option of the different options of where those electrons hit. Electrons are part of atoms that make up everything in our lives and our bodies and everything around us. So those are current, constantly moving and constantly having different, abil a different abilities to create different outcomes and we're only observing we, one outcome yes i mean you just took a a huge step ahead that's of me what, that's and what you're saying right yeah no you you extracted something extremely insightful that i'm like eight steps away from um which is pretty crazy um well i'm pretty so, smart so yeah no one's no one listening is surprised um but yeah there is something I'm trying to figure out how to draw a conclusion to what you just said without going through everything. But you're right. What we observe is just one outcome of the entire possibilities. What that proved is that what we observe is just one outcome of the entire possibilities available. So um, you shoot a thousand atoms at that wall, you will see every outcome happen, right? But if you shoot one, you're going to just see the manifestation of one of that probability probable spectrum basically and the first application of this so we're going to get it a little bigger they made these things called i don't know they're mag they're magnets made out of carbon or they're just carbon things and they become they're they're visible in your hand you could hold it but it's 60 carbon atoms and you can visibly kind of like dial in on it and see the 60 carbon carbon atoms if you use a microscope um, and they did the same experiment. It's like small scale, but it all of a sudden become tangible, like it's something you can hold. And they do the same thing, and you see this interference pattern. The thing that changed for the electrons and the interference pattern for these uh, little carbon things, I forget the name of them, but let's go back to the electrons. The thing that was wacky about this whole thing is they all of a sudden installed, they were like, all right, how is this possible? How is every, How are these atoms hitting all over this interference pattern how come what's what's making this happen um so they wanted to observe which slit it was going through um they wanted to observe which slit in this experiment the atom was going through before it hit the wall so that it could see what made it hit the wall so it's like all right if, if it's hitting on this right side this right interference pattern what what slit is this going through to make that happen right so they put a little like mechanism let's say on the right slit just to be like, all right, if it goes through this, the mechanism will fire, and then we'll look at the interference pattern and see where they can end up if they only go through the right side. And what they found out is as soon as they put that observation mecha mechanism on that and they shot a thousand atoms through the double slit experiment, you ended up getting the same pattern you would have gotten if you shot the paintball gun through the double slits. So as soon as you added a point of observation at the slit, 
rather than the only point of observation being the end point where you see the interference pattern, you add the observation point to the slit and it triggers every time one goes in and there's a probability that it will 50% of the atoms that make it to the end wall go through the right slit, right? So in doing that, they actually, that observation actually influenced what ended up resulting on the back wall. So it ended up being like that, that paintball experiment where if you did the same thing, you shot it, you would end up getting two vertical lines, but the electrons without observation until the back point would be an interference pattern. Explain, wait, explain again the actual point of observation at the, at the slit. How did they explain instill, how? how did they instill observation at the slit? It's like a for simplistic sake and because I don't really know, it's it's a sensor that fires every time the charge of an atom, the charge of an electron goes through that slit specifically. And like these slits don't have to be right next to each other. They don't have to be the slits don't have to be like in real in realism, these slits could be very far away from the electrons firing point. And the two slits can be very far away from each other. And then the back wall can be very far away from that. That none of the distances matter because this interference pattern it maintains true, but they're shooting these electrons through. Then all of a sudden they're tracing, okay, we want this, say it's a light, an indicator that on a computer looking back at it later slowed down or not slowed down, you can see whenever one hits the right side, which should be about 50% of the ones that make it through. Um, that being said, as soon as they did that and as soon as they finally had fired out a thousand, the interference pattern went away. And basically what that's saying is that that point of observation influenced the actions of the atoms past it. So it's basically saying, all right, we're now observing the atoms that come through this slit. And now, since we know that data point, they can make it to the end. And I know this is not, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, but What's revolutionary about that is that basically we're saying that like electrons have this probability of where there will be. We actually don't ever know where electrons are at any given point until we observe it and then it pops up. But we can predict in a probability sense where they might be in a certain space. But then as soon as we look at it, that's where it is, right? So... Schroeder's cat experience experiment. Let's move this up. This is this experiment was invented to kind of make tangible this concept and 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 really determine what it matters because like you're thinking about this now and even if observing a particle does influence its position later how does that affect you, right? Like how it's <coughs> <coughs> swallowed a bug. <coughs> Leftover rona. It does a <coughs> The big hornet you just swallowed. It was a murder hornet. Um, but what we're looking at here, and I'm sorry if you've been dragging along and not understanding. So the implications of this is that the universe is random, and the only thing that makes it not random is our obser observation of it. And that, like Cheek said, very preemptively is that everything is ha every possibility is happening at once and your observation creates your world but at the same time another world so if you go to schroeder's cat experiment which was one of the first attempts to this I, as far as i know this wasn't actually conducted but it's a very realistic question um and no one can disprove it is that he took a radioactive atom with a half-life of a day, which means that every day it, ra it, it um, decomposes 50% of its energy. Therefore, like that's why Chernobyl kills someone, right? Because it's radioactive. Every day, every time its half-life is reached, it, it shoots out radioactive particles. And at this particular level, if an atom's half-life is one day, if this atom's half-life is one day, then it should be, half of it should, um, de decompose is not the right word, but half of it should, um, 
should uh, break off and be basically Absolve. contaminous. Absolve, sure. Um, and that that's what radiation is bad because when something has a half-life like of a day, an electron kind of like shoots off and rogue electrons aren't great for your body. And that's where like cancer and radiation come in. And like that's what chemotherapy is. It's kind of all the same thing. But if a half-life of one day, the atom has a 50% chance statistic, quantum statistically of breaking down into um into a decomposed atom so what that's saying is that like there is a 50 percent chance that the atom stays the same and this is proven by that quantum that quantum experiment of shooting electrons at something basically saying that um shooting at the slit gives it a probability spectrum of where it'll end up so you're saying that the probability of this thing decomposing is 50 percent that's a fact. You may not understand that, but that is, and I may not have explained that well as more what that would come down to, but that is a fact. There's a 50% chance that it decomposes by its half-life, and there's a 50% chance that it stays the same. So what the Schroeder's cat, Schroeder's cat experiment does is it puts that radioactive element in a box, and it puts a cat in that box, um, and then it puts a vial of cyanide in that box as well, and it puts a mechanism in that box that is there to detect the radioactive decay of that atom. And if it detects too much radioactive decay, it swings a hammer down, opens that, pops open that, or breaks open that vial of cyanide, kills the cat. Okay? So, as you would expect, an atom put in that thing would radiate after its half light, trigger that hammer, break open the vial of cyanide, and kill that cat. This is in a, say it's in a closed box. You can't see it. There's nothing interfering with this. You would expect that. But there's also a chance that it doesn't radiate at its half, half-life. There's a 50-50 chance that this atom doesn't radiate, therefore not radiating out this the, the radiation, therefore not triggering the hammer to break the cyanide and kill the cat. So... There's a chance that you could open that box, and even with that radioactive particle in there, that cat's not dead. Was that ever observed? This, this is not an experiment that actually happened, but it's, like, logical. It could, like, it is true. Like, it could happen. There's a 50%, 50% chance that this atom does not <clears throat> radiate, does not become radioactive and shoot that radon out. Or I'm using the wrong terms, I'm sure, here, but... Um, it doesn't, it doesn't end up triggering that device and it doesn't end up hitting that cyanide. It doesn't end up hitting, hitting that cat. So while that box is closed, the concept of superposition comes into play. And superposition is basically saying that because we can't prove until we look where the atom is and its position is purely statistical, that it actually means that that electron or that radioactive element is both radioactive and not radioactive until we observe it. So, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. Is it until we observe it? What What's the point of the cat? Is the cat being, the cat's uh, are we assuming that the, the cat Adam has no observation? Decayed. Yeah, the the cat like literally it doesn't matter if it's a cat. It's like it it's the the point is that you can make this tangible to our daily lives. You can make this applicable to our daily lives and you can show how it actually like it means something. It's not something random, you know? It's not just some like little particular event that you look at and it's neat to know but it it doesn't affect us. The point of this application is to say that um when the atom breaks down it can actually affect the cat, but there's a chance that it doesn't. And our physics before that were very deterministic, and they would say that this atom would break down every day. Um, and and this is not a new finding in radiation. Radiation still behaves the same way that we thought, but the the fact of the matter is that at an atomic level, it is impossible to predict where these subatomic particles will be at any given time or what they will do at any given time until they are observed. Mm -hmm. And so here I will pull up 
One more thing. I'm on the wrong computer. Um, that's the chat. Let's see. If you guys have any questions, ask away. What kind of cat was it? Um, Mancoon. Me too. So, well, it's that hand with the dice. <laughs> I like that photo. Well, th that's kind of what quantum. Oh, that is sweet. Quantum entanglement is kind of a roll of the die, and this this little s double circle around here is uh, actually a diagram that's commonly used to display it's called, uh, the duality. Oh, it's also infinity, but um, the duality of where an atom can appear. So here are those interference patterns again. Each of these is technically a slit of where an atom is, right? Mm -hmm. or where an atom uh, can yeah, go yeah, through. Yeah. This is not what you see the atom going through. It's the probability. If there was just the one, possibilities, yeah. yeah. If there was just one slit, the atom could go through and go off any of these different directions, right? It could bounce off the edge. It can be influenced by the edge. It can go straight through all these rings. If it goes through this other slit by itself, this. But then, since it could go through both then it has to run in your interference pattern like like dropping those two pebbles <laughs> into water um so let's go back to the you remember how i said that the probability of where an atom will appear is like a heartbeat um at the very beginning mm -hmm. um these here are kind of like that heartbeat this is a these are waves basically saying uh the way these are supposed to be interpreted is horizontally on the x-axis that is the momentum of an atom and vertically is the position so at any point in time you would be if the observer could see it most likely at these top peaks least likely at these lower peaks especially these ones so like it could be here it could be here most likely it could be here but it's least likely same thing with these peaks up here in the top right um that's the only way to predict where an atom is because an atom, an electron or a proton or a neutron, they aren't anywhere until you look at them. Um, because they can be so, anywhere. Because they can be anywhere. That's what that interference pattern means. That's the implication of that f interference pattern is that you are able to you're able to predict the places that an atom is most likely to be seen, but you cannot know exactly where it'd be until you observe it specifically. So you need a point of observation like that monitor in the right slit or like that paper on the back that shows the interference pattern. Um, that is just, those are just observation points simplified. And another observation point simplified is when you look at the radioactive particle and you say that it has a half-life of one day and after eight days you can reasonably expect that the cat would be dead but there is a chance that it's not because these probability patterns of where the electrons may be where these radiation when these radiations might occur occur basically say that there's a chance that it it didn't decay over those four days there's always a 50 percent chance that it did not decay over those four days and so when you open that box it is actually not certain whether or not that cat will be alive and at the same time it is dead because of that because if you only shoot one particle off or only have one form of radiation it's basically saying that when you open that box that cat is both dead and alive um and you might ask how can something be both dead and alive it's because basically at that point of observation you split those two realities into half um Relating, relating this in layman's terms to a common question of if a, if a tree falls in the woods, can you hear it? You have to relate this to quantum mechanics. Would it be you could only tell at the moment of observation if a tree fell or not? So in one, in one path, a tree never fell. In one path, the tree did fall, but as soon as someone observes that tree, that's when it renders. It renders. That is so. There are three common theories of quantum entanglement, and the tree theory, like the bigger you get, the reason the cat experiment is valid the most, like the first step you go to is it's because it's it, in a closed box. You go to that atom where this is actually happening directly, right? That one atom 
has that probability of where it can be at all times. And that ends up directly relating through decay to the cat's life. And that's like, it's really weirdly communicable to something tangible. The tree experiment gets weirder because we know science and physics and things like that. And there's some assumptions we can make. But ultimately, all that stuff is based on the atoms we're made of. It's just like the probabilities get sharper. So like the probability that it just fell is a higher peak than like the things that maybe it just spawned. But there are still probabilities that that happened. So that being said, I want you to look at this um, interference pattern here. This is a 3D version of the interference pattern. And if you understand this, it's basically saying that like the ups and downs and the width of the vol volatile nature of this diagram are everywhere that an atom could appear or an electron could appear. The thing that collapses that waveform is how they call it, is your observation. And so like this, if there's eight atoms or uh, six atoms and you look at this, the peaks of these are where they end up, right? But originally it's this. You're looking at this, you're saying this is the equation for where they could end up. But when you finally observe it, when you put in that monitor, when you slap them against a the wall or something like that, this is where they actually end up, those six. You shoot six at it. That's the... That's just a result of a probability. Do you know how to explain the difference between there's in the first image, there's depths where it goes below the, the plane. And in mm -hmm. this one, it's just a sheer plane with only things above it. Well, this, so this is a, it's as if there was a sheet that was manipulated to show the 3d space that this thing could appear in. So right. technically this observation point one of these could have been below the sheet. It could have been a dip. But we right? just wouldn't be able to see it. But this is showing that like at the, the very visual. needle of these, that's actually where you found them. Um, and it's almost like a heat map. Um, so I'm trying to find a way that we can transition into that tree thing a little faster. But um, what, I, what I do want to say is that how... How how you're supposed to look at this is that it's not it's not what you expect. It's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Um, not in a in not in our Western way of thinking. But um, one of the way the MIT lectures I was looking at explained it was that if you have a box electrons, if you say that electrons can be either white or black, not gray, not in the middle. Electrons can be either white or black, and that's it. Um, and you get a box that basically can filter out um, whether or not what it can filter the white ones and the gray ones. So you have a box that kind of says on the right side of the box. Um, let's see, I need to switch over this camera. On the right side of the box, the white ones will come out. On the top side of the box, the um, on the top side of the box, the black ones will come out. It splits the atoms, basically, because if you're shooting an atom, an electron in there, there's a 50% chance that it's black, 50% chance that it's white. You put it into this device, this mythical device that can be a splitter. It can split it into 50% black, 50% white. You do that experiment with thousands of different indicators, thousands of different devices that can sense that. Every single time, this electron will turn out white on one side, black on the other side. You're splitting it in half. If you then say that electrons can also be either hard or soft, there's no middle ground for if an electron could be hard or soft, it's one or the other, and you take all the white particles that you sorted out of that box, you shot the electrons in, you sorted out the white ones through that kind of divider, that Y junction, you took all the, y, all the white ones out, shot them into a hard and soft indicator, those at a 50-50 rate would be hard and soft, right? You get what I'm saying? Maybe not the implications, but do you follow what I'm saying? Do you have a grasp on it? So, so you shoot them through the first box. They come out black and white. You're saying, I only want to look at the white ones, even though the black ones have the same properties. It doesn't matter. You just look at the black ones, say. Mm -hmm. They come out, they go through a box, and that way, and now you're trying, you put it through a hard, soft splitter, Y, y junction, reverse Y junction. And you say that um, out of that box, you're going to have white, you're going to have hard and soft particles coming out. Now, you would assume, right? You would assume that if you were to test for color again, if you were to shoot those back through color, you initially put in black particles, they came out hard and soft, and you're like, all right, let's test now just the soft particles coming out of that. 
you would assume that the particles that came out of that would only be black, right? Because you already filtered the blacks out, the black particles out. No, uh, you've lost me. Particles are already black. Is, is right. there an is there an image you can pull up to explain this? Yeah. Cheek, do you have a grasp? Can we take a pee break real quick? Yeah. And then come back. <clears throat> yeah. So here's the deal, folks. You might be wondering why you're hearing my voice right now, but uh, the bozos made a collective decision that uh, a single episode shouldn't go more than three hours. So what we're doing here um, is this session went about three went about to two and a half or three hours and we decided that when that happens we're going to split the episode into two uh release one on monday and one on wednesday or thursday uh so you guys just heard part one of the quantum physics um we've already recorded part two so we kind of know how it goes and i know part one was a little rough and might be hard to understand but stay with us and you'll get it too it's a it's a complex complex thing it's been it's been a lot of time learning it so uh just stay tuned and we'll uh We'll sort this whole thing out. We'll all be quantum physicists by the end of it. Uh, look forward to the next version of this episode coming out next week. Um, and, or later this week, I should say. So talk to you guys soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>